Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back. Okay, guys. As always, want to thank everybody for your support over on the growing Patreon family. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. We couldn't get by without the support we get over on Patreon. Now, settle up, go get some nibbles, as one of my favorite YouTube channels uh, says. He's from over on the other side of the pond, and uh, he would always say, get a spot of tea and some nibbles, because this one's going to be a good one. It's going to be a fun one. And I just hope that we could connect some dots for people that maybe um, have some gaps in their understanding of, of what is going on. So this is, again... Um, <laughs> <laughs> an amphibian uh no I'm, well maybe actually you know this is albert borla pf Iser, chairman ceo and he's the one that we've seen with that neck condition you know it just seems to billow out just like a bullfrog at times so what he's talking about is the fact that they can use mrna to deliver edits that if successful would change a person's DNA. And then they say perhaps even fix or possibly even cure genetic uh, disease. Again, our understanding right now is expanding exponentially because we have been in so just pitch darkness when it comes to uh, the human condition and understanding what's going on in the world around them. We have been in the darkest of dark ages, and that is all changing. It's changing in really big ways and in some ways that people might not understand. And I, I guess we want to put a spotlight on that so people do understand the changes. Yeah. And, and again, this one, I think maybe um, will definitely get some light bulbs going for, for those that um, don't have the clear picture yet, although I know of our patrons and our regular subscribers on youtube brighty and bit shoot rumble uh you guys for the most part really get it um really really get it and yeah there's always little spots that can have gaps filled but the main thing here again is gene editing and the idea that that human dna can be changed mutated you know artificially um altered and in fact, you know, the reality is it has many, many times. And in fact, it's an ongoing program here on planet Earth. Uh, and that's kind of a big statement. But there's so many things when we piece things together that start to make sense. Now, there's something called CRISPR, which I know a lot of you guys are familiar with. Again, that's a gene editing technique. This is talking about, quote-unquote, junk DNA and genome evolution. Uh, again, it's been said that up to and over 90% of our DNA is, doesn't seem to be doing anything specifically. Well, you know, again, we're going to deep dive into that. And there's also a second chromosome fusion that we've talked about in the past many, many times which could not happen naturally. It has to be artificially. And, and again, that means that you and I, we've been gene edited. Our ancestors were gene edited. So when we're seeing this quote unquote new mRNA uh, therapy, it's just another uh, revisionist history that it's been in existence a very, very long time. And also, uh, techniques far beyond the techniques of uh, the Homo sapiens that are doing the gene editing do exist and and are utilized on a much higher level. You know, it's really really sad that nobody's updating the uh, hominid family tree. They really aren't, and and I keep looking for one that's more inclusive because we keep discovering more and more varieties of humanoid beings that have lived on this planet as much as they utilize wars in order to do several things but one of the things that's done in a period of war is obliterating the past wiping out evidence of of different humans that have walked on this planet 
The desire is to make it look like everything that came before Homo sapiens um, were nothing more than maybe a slightly more advanced monkey or chimpanzee. That's not the case. Not the case at all. And for those that have um, gone down this route before, I'm sure you're a well, well aware of the fact that when you look to right here, Neanderthals and then also Denisovans, for instance, they both had larger brain brains than we do. Larger. And they were both physically more robust and stronger. Now, you see the one right next to it here, Florensiensis. Uh, that's the one that's also referred to as the Hobbit. So these were guys, uh, you know, beings, people that were about three foot tall, three, three and a half foot tall. And, you know, Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, were definitely bigger boned, more robust. You know, think about some of those, you know, football players you've seen and, and people we would say are big boned people. Very, very hardy and robust, bigger brain. Why, why, why did Homo sapiens wipe them out? Well, the reality is Homo sapiens didn't wipe them out, as you see Homo sapiens here. And there's so many other uh, hominid species that we see on down the line. And again, this is not even showing the half of it. Homo erectus is another interesting one. The reality is what we've gotten from the guides is that when you look to Denisovans and Neanderthals, they had to be eliminated from the uh, dominance on Earth because they were not really controllable. They needed to create a more controllable human to work and not question. And so they were both eliminated. One kind of knew what was going on because, you, again, you have to realize the fact that there are extraterrestrial beings that come and go from this planet is something that was known to everybody on Earth in, in a different age. If you go back, I would say pre-2000 BC, uh, yeah, everybody knew. And in fact, even even much earlier, right around 2300 BC, you still had a lot of people believing in the gods and when we use that term really it would be so wonderful if they would just simply uh, get rid of that term and just say you know those that have more knowledge more understanding people that are allowed and and have a knowledge that that humans typical humans and homo sapiens doesn't and the reason is uh, because again this this is ultimately a refugee planet and this is a depiction you know of um, a Denisovan if we just simply tweak that a little bit give him a you know clean shave and and put him in a nice suit you could he could walk down the street and, and you wouldn't think anything uh, of him being anything not Homo sapiens. Again, we have Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA in some of our genes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much that could be changed in the literature that, that we're given to read that would bring about a clearer picture. And it would be so clear that you could then look back and you could say, wow, this is really deliberate. You know, the deliberate um idea to to really lead people astray lead them astray into a belief system that's just gonna really help them be more and more controlled but yeah i mean it's to me it's all in the all in the wording all in how they how they uh position certain people and certain words and make things look a certain way it's just not true i mean the truth is is that it is people who have much more knowledge than we do. People who have a, a much broader understanding are the ones who are giving giving us the Bible. They're the ones who are giving us the um, 
the news outlets, they're the ones who give us the food. They're the ones who give us the education and the media. And, and that's because they do. They have that wider knowledge base um, to keep us in control. So when we look at individuals like these, again, representations of other hominids that have lived on this planet, very easy to, uh, again, clean them up, <clears throat> dress them up, and they could walk right past you and you wouldn't even notice. Homo erectus, uh, which they tell us, again, 1.8 million to about 140,000 years ago, uh, was very expansive in both Asia and also in Africa. And in reality, you can still find people today um, that are that that don't look really any different from the probable more accurate depictions of Homo erectus. See, as they always want to give them more body hair and make them look scruffy and like they're unintelligent. But no, no. The, again, these these are. Um, beings that in some ways were vastly superior to uh, Homo sapiens as far as their ability to see into nature, to see into other uh, dimensions, densities, to understand the oneness of all life, uh, to feel the heartbeat of the mother uh, underneath their feet. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, these, these right here, Homo erectus, would be around four and a half feet tall, uh, typically very slightly built, but you still have people that are like that today. And we have tribes today that have been living in harmony with, with nature. And if we have an economic collapse, if there is a big plague that, you know, that wipes out again 90, 95% of the Homo sapiens, it won't really change much in their world because they're used to getting along without us anyway. Uh, and even though he's eating the larvae, he's doing that thing that, that Klaus has been pushing. You know, again, I'd rather not. But but hey, hey if, if, if that's what he's got to do to survive, then that's what he's got to do to survive. This is another depiction of a, of a Homo erectus and, you know, a little bit more... Um, maybe friendlier you know, depiction of a Homo erectus. Uh, again, we, we would walk right by these people because, you know, right today you have tribes of people that average four to four and a half feet tall, literally, um, in, in certain areas and, and barely ever, if, if ever, come in contact with Homo sapiens. Again, and this is not just Africa. This is also in Asia. This is also in South America. Look at the size difference. And, and this is a full grown adult. And he's probably, I don't know, 40 inches tall, maybe, you know, just a little bit over three feet tall. This is all taught. This is just to show there's a massive variation in, in humans even among all Homo sapiens, or what we perceive to be Homo sapiens on the planet. Massive. This is the same guy, by the way, Drew Binsky. You can see over here, he's not even up to their shoulders with this one tribe. And again, another tribe, they're, not, they're barely up to his shoulder. This is today. This is today. The Earth in... The last Bronze Age, oh, wow. I mean, the life forms you would see on Earth would blow you away. You still have people in those times that were living tribally like a lot of these are in these times. Albeit, you know, these two tribes are down in Western clothes for the most part. Um, but the other ones we were talking about, no. So again, you can see that humans come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And did they all ev evolve here on Earth? Uh, the answer is no. And, and one of the reasons why you have all the different sizes, shapes, and colors is because Earth is a refugee planet. It has always been a refugee planet. So you have humanoid beings that are under pressure from this, you know, again, think Star Wars, a dark galactic empire that is very, very um, totalitarian, evil. And, and literally, you could think again to uh, what they told us with Battlestar Galactica, 
uh, would exterminate humans if they don't comply with uh, the empire, so to speak. And this is also going on in other densities. So why we see all these different shapes and sizes? I mean, literally, it's mind-boggling, the differences. I mean, here you have the tallest man that was alive at this point in time. I'm not sure if he passed on now. And, and the shortest woman. They're both homo sapiens. Look at, she comes up to his knee. It's again, it's not because of, uh, oh, they have a gene that went uh, in a negative direction, you know, in one way with one person, one way with the other. No, no, no. It's because these genes are that way because they come from different backgrounds. And we are all a mix of many different backgrounds. Again, this is an old shot from probably the 70s. You could see, you know, these are adults and, and they're, you know, three foot something to maybe four foot or a little bit over. It's a natural variance because, again, we are many, many different tribes. We are many, many different people here on this planet and we come from different places. We come from different places. Uh, the, the reason why we are so in the dark is because we've had our, our minds wiped. And there is a natural veil, so to speak. When we come into an incarnation, there is some of a natural veil that's put over us to make it so that we have a fresh experience, a new experience, an experience we could totally immerse ourselves in, think it is the only reality to a degree, and learn from it. Because again, if you're not fully immersed in the experience, could you possibly you know, learn to your max? Mm. You know, it's for expansion, the purposes of expansion, and that's just at our core, at our very, very core, that's the nature of our being is, is to expand. But there are natural veils and there are veils that are deliberately put over us and our human bodies that we have now they're really there's a lot of um there's a lot of shadows there's a lot of blind corners there's a lot of things that we cannot see because artificially they've been put into place so that to misdirect us so we cannot see um, we're not the same type of humans as the tribals. They, tribal people, they're there. They can read the land. They can read the weather. They can read whatever they need to, the insects. The, they can watch the animals. They have so much deeper understanding, a shamanic way of life. And they don't have these same veils that we have had put over us. There are natural people, you could call them a wild people, but they are very, very natural. And they have instincts that absolutely would blow us away, absolutely blow us away because they haven't been uh, impeded. They haven't been educated, you know, they haven't been, um, they haven't been uh, misled. They haven't been manipulated. They've just been left to evolve and i'll tell you those are probably some of the humans that the controllers are afraid of because they would see past all the bs i mean i think they would see all of our tablets and our tvs and just and just be really like what the heck is going on here you know because they are truly one with the earth and they know how to read the earth and they know how to read and get by day to day without um, all of the extras, without all of the extra veils. And we have several, you know, it's not just one or two veils. I mean, we have several over us and, and that, that redirect us in ways that don't help us. Yeah, and so there's the natural and then there's the unnatural. And again, uh, the darkness of this dark matrix is really truly about knowledge. You know, of course, it's about their, you know, the frequencies in which they uh, envelop us, which are all low fear based. Uh, and that's that's just to basically keep us constantly in fight or flight, constantly where cortisol is being produced and we can't heal. We, we can't get into the rest and digest side of our um, system, you know. 
they'll tell us that between 1854 and 1929, over 250,000 orphans were put on trains in the overcrowded East. Well, yeah, the population of the U.S. was about you know, a third or less than what it was, according to the stats they give us, um, in that time. You're going to call it overcrowded, and it's not now? Uh, anyway, and they were sent to every state in the continental U.S. to find new homes. Some children were pre-assigned to homes, but many were lined up at train stations for those interested in adopting or needing laborers and were selected like a, li a lottery. As you see the kids lining up, you know, there's something that is so dark and evil about this. Uh, here you go, a company of orphan children of different ages in charge of, et cetera, et cetera, arrive in your town Thursday, May 4th. Find homes for these kids. Where did these kids come from? Are they the result of wars? Eight, 1854 is before the Civil War. So why were there so many orphans before the Civil War in the United States? Um, you know, again, there's a lot that is not taught to us. In 1910, you see this, Homes for Children, Company of Homeless Children from the East will arrive in Troy, Missouri. Uh, that's 1910, so that's before World War I. And then it goes back into the 1800s. Conditions for orphans, 1800s, were heartbreaking beyond imagining. Poverty, epidemics, war, alcoholism. Well, same thing today with all that going on. Unscrupulous profiteering sold orphans for work in labor farms, workhouses, factories, mines. And petty crime rings. We, we have that story echoing um, from some of our famous literature of the day. Yeah, very, very, very sad situation that we found uh, has existed for a long period of time. These things still go on today. Uh, and this is revealing the secrets of baby farm and cabbage baby. Uh, the postcards, we have this book. Um, I ordered the book, and it is very disconcerting, really, and it is just bizarre. It, it's bizarre, and it's it, it just it doesn't seem natural for sure. Yeah, no, and it, it just have you ever just this is just an aside. Do you ever like really listen to fairy tales? They're pretty darn dark and twisted. When you look at like Grimm's fairy tales, they're very grim. And it, it's just fascinating uh, to see all this. Where did all these babies come from? And there are references of babies as if they're almost being grown. Grown. And then we see exhibits for incubators and stuff at World's Fairs. And, and repopulate the planet. Well, what happened? There's nothing in the history books that accounts for the level of repopulation uh, that would be necessary. Uh, yes, we had the Civil War, but we're talking way after the Civil War, and we're talking before the Civil War. And then we have all the mud floods, too, uh, which you know we've touched on on many other videos. So why are we talking now about a fish guy, a merman, right? Well, it, it's fascinating because the story of Oans, or also Dagon, Oans uh, over here in one culture and, and Dagon in another culture seem to be talking about the same classification of beings. And yeah, it looks like he's either a fish man or he's wearing a fish suit. Um, very, very curious to say the least. And when you look to these stories, uh, they're actually very well uh, documented. Barossus, um, a historian, gave an account um, that is pretty interesting, clear, and, and written down in a very concise manner. And again, the other question is, too, why are these guys always carrying around many purses, whether we're talking 
uh, the fishmen, the birdmen, or those that we would call the Anunnaki, you know, they're always carrying around these little mani purses, like it has some sort of technology. This is a, a quote from Barossus. At Babylon, there was in these times a great resort of people of various nations who inhabited Chaldea and lived in a lawless manner like the beasts of the field. In the first year, there appeared from that part of the Erythian Sea, which borders upon Babylonia, an animal destitute of reason by the name Oans, whose whole body, according to the account, uh, account of Apoldor, Apol, uh, Apollodorus, was that of a fish, that under the fish's head he had another head, with feet also below, similar to those of a man, subjoined to the fish's tail. His voice, too, and language was articulated and human, and representation of him is preserved even to this day. So this quote is actually coming from around 300 BC. Now, just to give you a comparison, if you're looking for, well, what do we have from the Hebrew um, Bible, the Old Testament, the, uh, say, the, the five books of Moses, uh, how much do we have in one place, from, from one piece, one, one scroll? It, it's not even as much as this from 300 uh, BC. The reality is we have tiny little fragments, one word, two words, three words, little, little pieces. You have to go to around 900 to 1000 AD to get a complete copy. So this is something that we should uh, look at and say, huh, this is really curious. This being was accustomed to passing the day among men, but took no food at that season. And he gave them an insight into letters and sciences and arts of every kind. So, again, people will, if all they know is the Bible, they'll, they'll say, Ooh, I wonder if this is one of those Nephilim, though he's not really depicted as being big. And then if they read the book of Enoch, they will say he's a fallen angel. And he's one of the ones that taught humanity, again, these things, the letters, sciences, and the arts of every kind. But what you have to recognize is, again, the Bible is the most distorted version of all. And, and the Bible is the, is the control systems version. Because when you look to the original language and these accounts that are in the Bible, you'll find it, it was never about one creator God. No, it, it, was, it was about this classification of beings that's called Elohim in Hebrew, but it's really the same as the gods of Greek mythology, the gods of Sumerian mythology, the gods of all mythology, really all over the world. So he, he spent time amongst humans and he taught them things. He taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge, he made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect the fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which could tend to soften manners and humanize their lives. From that time, nothing material has been added by way of improvement to his instructions. And when the sun had set, this being Oans retired again into the sea, and he passed the night in the deep, for he was amphibious. After this, there appeared other animals like Oans. And that's from Barossus. Uh, so this is just very, very curious. But what's interesting, too, is that when Cindy looks, and we did channeling before, and we asked, who were the first humanoid beings upon this planet? What comes up is humanoid beings that lived in the water. Little little blue beings, little little blue beings that were um, could live in the water, could work off the land, but very very versatile, very um, very gentle. You know, I pick up a very gentle type of way about them, um, a very peaceful way is what I pick up. Um, you know, their skin is pretty blue. It, it's beautiful blue, a little bit darker. Um, 
but their their mannerisms is what I was really drawn to and their gentle their gentle nature about how they how they went about taking care of each other and taking care of the land and um you know gathering gathering I don't pick I didn't pick up that they eat any meat at that time so um just a very kind natured entity and you saw them as human humanoid but legs or or fins um gosh the fins are they'd be really small on on the arms and really small on the legs is what i see and then i see something with the ears i see something going on with the ears that i don't really recognize the the fact is there's many different <clears throat> types of humanoid beings out there again we are a refugee planet we are a planet that's loaded with migrants i think this is very interesting to me um is is the way they have this depicted here were they able to shape shift was there some sort of um uh, ability like that in there you know, one of the strangest things that ever happened to me was in Sarasota. Uh, you might be f familiar with Siesta Key Beach. There was a beach farther down uh, that I used to go to when I lived in Sarasota and in Venice. And I would put out in a floaty and <laughs> just fall asleep almost, you know, floating out there at the beach. And one time I was out there with a friend and we were way off, way off the shore kind of we're taking a nap out there about 100 yards off the beach and i saw something that could only be described as what really looked like a a man swimming but totally upright like if you put water here uh it's just in an upright position that that humans can't swim in so I yelled over to my friend and said, do you see him? And, and they saw him and we had no explanation for it. But it really makes me wonder if it was one of those beings uh, just saying hi, because again, they could read energy. So they could read energy and they know who would be able to perceive them um, by your energy body. And then we have the old Pope hat, <laughs> which looks like it's mimicking uh, the Dagon fish head. And we have the staff, and Dagon's also, uh, or Oans is off often depicted with the staff as well. So are they emulating them? Are they saying that they are now the keepers of the knowledge, and they will disseminate uh, what they feel the rest of humanity needs to know and that's it that's that's kind of my take mm -hmm. i don't feel that they deserve to be keepers of the knowledge i think they've really been abusive of, of that of that title um i do think that the vatican has more knowledge than we can really fathom or understand right there underneath it um a, a lot of information comes out but it's it's come out it comes out as they want it to um it's very controlled so when we were talking about Oans uh, over there in Sumeria, Acadia, Babylon, <clears throat> and then we were talking about Dagon, which was of the Philist Philistines, the Dogon, Dagon, Dogon, pretty similar, isn't it? The Dogon tribes in Africa claim that space travelers called the Nomo, Nomo, gave them advanced knowledge of our solar system and the Sirius star system, which is 8.6 light years away. They were especially um, interesting as they know about a dark star named Sirius B, which is visible from Earth only with advanced technology. This is again, how did they know that it was a binary star system? And in fact, it's trinary because we're part of that star system. Um, how did they know about it when you couldn't see it? And there's other knowledge, too, that they had that you you couldn't know. And again, it's interesting just that they are called the Dogen, and you think about Dagon. It, uh, did they name themselves after the same entity is kind of the question. Uh, again, talking about these beings that 
came from elsewhere and they they were, were revered the they were revered by them and so it's it's fascinating to see this because this is uh farther down in africa again away from the mediterranean away from uh you know the indian ocean and the gulf area very very curious to say the least how did they possibly know about this but again the knowledge that's given in the in the vedas and in the other hindu uh, holy books is is well beyond what we would be able to know unless we really could tap into uh universal knowledge tap into again the akashic records or we were directly taught all these things again by extraterrestrials i think really one of the biggest things that's holding back the understanding in so many of the masses is is the religious indoctrination that's given to us in the abrahamic traditions because the abrahamic traditions have wiped out everybody that has this knowledge they have systematically gone and conquered and then supplanted the indigenous beliefs and knowledge with their own. This has been another level of mind wipe. So when you have people insisting that, you know, the earth is flat, you can't get through the dome, the firmament's impossible, um, and there's nobody else but us, or it's fallen angels, this distortion serves a control system that's the only person it serves is the control system and people will say things like well then why do they want to you know hide this or hide that why why do they give a wiki to flat earth well part of the reality is that the earth is bigger than what we are told uh the antarctica landmass is much much bigger and there is the inner earth uh, which is populated and also that underneath the oceans there are cities with beings that you know again we could look at them as extraterrestrials even if they've been here longer than us they have been here for a very long time a absolutely you know again some of them predate homo sapiens homo sapiens in other words is the newer rendition homo sapiens is the the last gene edited edition of, of humans upon the planet where the system goes around and and again there's so many different humanoid species that have come to this planet in the past looking for refuge from the galactic war that's ongoing and wanting to start life over just like is repeated with you know the one wave of migrants after another this immigrant migrant waves these these immigrant migrant waves that we see on earth are an echo of that on a galactic scale and its cause is the same it's 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 that galactic empire out there so again they even knew the elliptical period they knew the orbit period of these stars there's no way they could have known that there's no way they could have known that and they also explained uh, that the Nomo were inhabitants of a world circling the star Sirius. When you look to Aset, Isis is, is her uh, name that most of you would know. Uh, when you talk about Isis and her coming to Earth, she was part of the Galactic Federation that came to Earth and she is from Sirius. Uh, that's where she was from. And, and again, a lot of the Egyptian pantheon was uh, from Sirius. And so, you know, they are relatives to us. Uh, and also, they are teachers to us. Now, the beings that came here with the Galactic Federation were uh, very, very benevolent beings. And, and they were all trying to help us and at the same time not interfere too much in our uh, lives and you know what we have with that which we have come to call the anunnaki which again is a very very open-ended term it just means you know all those that come from out there to here 
But if we're going to be more specific, the ones that Cindy calls the fallen Pleiadians, uh, the Nibiru winds, and again, even on Nibiru, Nibiru is uh, a migrant planet as well, uh, and a much, much larger planet that is really more of a mothership at this point in time. It is a very, very large one currently outside the orbits of Uranus and Neptune because it cannot get any closer without causing disruption as it utilizes a black hole propulsion system to move. So it is more of a, um, it's more of a mothership now than an actual planet. So, you know, they even have celebrations about these sky beings because, again, the Nomo were thought to be benevolent. But the system has uh, taken over the holding of the knowledge, even though the tribal people still understand. Uh, again, most of the tribal people of the world have had their, their lives, their history, their knowledge all taken from them. And then they're converted to uh, the control system religions. So we see this artifact again showing uh, Owan's Dagon. And when you look to in the names of God, this is a literal translation. In the beginning, the mighty ones, the Elohim, the mighty ones, the powerful ones, the ones from the stars, uh, the judges, the those that rule over earth created heaven and earth. So it alludes to the fact that the earth was formless and empty. And this is an allusion to the fact that what happened was the Galactic Federation, along with the super consciousness that resides within and through all of us, recreated from the remnants of Tiamat, which was destroyed again by the draconian uh, AI uh, power structure empire. They took the largest remnant and they created the Earth from that. So what you see is plural. So this is the original Hebrew and it's in the plural and it's 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 not a concept of a trinity. They didn't have that concept incorporated into their belief system and it wasn't even really a belief system. It was a remembering who you are when we're talking about the people that were writing this because you know again they actually were brought here from Mars uh, to Earth. So it is interesting that so many uh, channels get the same information, very, very similar information, but again, use discernment uh, as well in all things. See what resonates with you. When we look to the Chaldean Genesis, and the Chaldean, again, is part of that Fertile Crescent area, which is part of modern-day modern Iraq, which was part of the, the Greater Sumerian Empire, uh, and these are, again, much older accounts than anything biblical, much, much older. And this book itself, it was actually written in, I think, 1875, if I remember right. Um, I finished this one a few weeks ago. The first series, he's talking about um, many different series of of scriptures that he has been able to piece together. This is an archaeologist, and uh, there's there's many of them, but one of the things that he does make note of is it's like somebody wanted to destroy them because they revise the history is what they do time and time again. The story of the creation and the fall, when complete, must have consisted of nine or ten tablets at least, the history upon it is much longer and fuller than corresponding account in the book of Genesis. Yeah, this is what we find. Where you have two or three lines in the Genesis account, you'll have hundreds in, in the Sumerian tablets that give much more detail. So again, it's ev every single time you look, it's plural. These, these are extraterrestrials. It's, it's not the creator, not the original creator of this universe. And it's, it's not uh, uh, even just forces of nature. What they're talking about is extraterrestrials. It's always been extraterrestrials and interdimensional beings as well. The uh, control system account is that that we get from the Abrahamic tradition. 
look to the native indigenous traditions of the world if you want to get closer to the truth. Indeed. As always, guys, look forward to your comments. Source bless and namaste. Namaste.